Welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast, where we bring you the most interesting and enlightening conversations around movement practice and how you can become the most heroic version of yourself through pursuing movement that's relevant to your nature. This is a podcast that's going to feature some of the top movers in the world, some of the most amazing movement thinkers, and people from fields that are related to movement as far afield as evolutionary theory, strength and conditioning, and everything in between. So if you're interested in movement, please stick around. And if you like our work and want to support it, please consider supporting us on Patreon because this podcast is completely listener supported. We don't want to take any advertising. We don't want to interrupt your experience of watching the show. So what really helps us get the best thinkers on, have the time to put these together, have the best quality for you guys as far as audio and video is your support. So please consider supporting us and enjoy the rest of the show. Hey guys, welcome back to the Evolve Move Play podcast. This week, our guest is George Brill. So George is a young anthropologist and you know athlete. He trains in ultra running and rock climbing uh, and free diving, and he has gone to study the Batek people uh, informally, not as a with an academic institution, but bringing a lot of his academic background to it. Um, I ran into his research and I was really fascinated by it. And I thought it'd be the great grounds for a conversation. So we go deep in anthropological theory. We talk about evolutionary backgrounds, how human beings evolved their locomotive capacities. We talk about cultural backgrounds. We talk about um, the, the intersection between spirituality and movement and traditional lifestyles, uh, which I think you guys will find really fascinating. Uh, so George is not someone uh, who's super well known yet. Um, but I think that he's carving an extremely unique and really interesting niche for himself in the world. And I'm extremely happy to get the chance to have this conversation with him and to help forward his voice to many people who I think uh, are going to find what he's doing super interesting. So enjoy my conversation with uh, George Brill. Get this started. So yeah, George, really nice to meet you. Uh, thanks for joining me on the channel. No um, let's, let's start with a little bit about yourself. So I, I came across your work because I was just searching for climbing, right? Cause uh, you know, mm -hmm. an interest of mine given my work. Um, oh, sure. And I saw your article. Actually, the first thing I saw was a video that you posted. I was looking up uh, Batek people climbing cause I wanted mm -hmm. to just kind of cross compare the way that people were climbing. And I didn't realize this until later, but it was a video that you'd shot. Um, it's yeah. a beautiful little moment of this little boy climbing up a, a pole. Sure. Yeah, I know the one. Uh, that's, uh, that's like a lean to, right? And then, yeah. then yeah. it's playing in the trees. Um, and I shared it on our Evolve Move play group, and I just thought it was awesome. And then somehow, um, I ended up reading your essay on tree climbing in the Patek people and how you've gone mm -hmm. to study it. Like, so this is what I, you know, <laughs> what I wish I'd been able to do because I was an anthropology student as well. Okay. Um, and you know, the idea of studying movement and studying it among uh, hunter foragers was fascinating. So, mm -hmm. how was it that you ended up going to study tree climbing among the Patek people? Yeah, so so I, like you, like you, I did biological anthropology at university, focused very much on hunter gatherers and also human performance, sort of evolutionary performance. Myself, I'm I'm in, I'm a rock climber, long distance runner, that sort of thing. So my interest is kind of in that sort of things too. And then so and then so what I did after I graduated, I should add actually the research I did with the Batek was not linked to any university or anything. It was it wasn't official research. It was more just me going to go and out of my sort of more personal interest thing to go and have a look at how they do it and see what I could learn from it, I guess, in the similar way you were looking at it. Yeah. So basically, once I graduated, I then headed off to look, look into things like free diving, climbing, long distance running, swimming, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, went, to, went to, for example, athletes down in Indonesia, free diving athletes, running athletes, and then also trying to look at indigenous groups. And the Batek is a very famous group anthropologically, I'm sure. Obviously, you'll be aware of that as well. Yeah. And because I knew so much, well, I'd heard so much about them, they're, they're kind of one of the archetypal anthropological groups. I'd heard a lot about them during my degree. And so I figured that they would be a good start. I was looking for, like you, looking for a group that climbed. And the two who are very aware of was the Korowai in Papua New Guinea and the Batek in Malaysia. And obviously, Papua New Guinea is a little bit of an unstable place, not particularly easy to get to these places around there. And so I figured, well, I'll just go to Malaysia and see if I could find a group of Batek. And um, the, so what initially started is just sort of a, to head out and go and see them. I, I ended up finding a, a com it's kind of like a volunteerism company that I went and interned with for about three months. They did a little bit of work on the outskirts of, the, of one of the Batek villages teaching kids English. 
mm -hmm. um, which is something the Batek are very keen to learn. And so I kind of got to know a few of them that way and then eventually went and lived in the village and ended up living there on and off over, over a period of about two years. I probably spent about three months in the village living with them, learned the language and sort of worked with it from there. And it was through actually the Batek themselves that I came into contact with a couple of academics who had studied tree climbing. Mm -hmm. And then from that, I looked at kind of their their work and then started applying that as well as applying it in a more practical sense of trying to learn it myself i suppose yeah I'm, and yeah yeah so it kind of another paper you're speaking of I'm, I'm trying to remember the names of the of the two academics but it's it's a paper on how essentially yeah so they, they've written, yeah they've written a few papers the, the names are you've got vivek ben Carterman and thomas Kraft. And uh, the two of them, I think they both they both started doing stuff on tree climbing during their PhD, or at least Vivek did. And I, no, I think they both did. And anyway, they've done more with it since. They both did their PhDs, I believe, at Harvard, I think, okay. um, or might have been Dartmouth, and then moved to Harvard as postgrad. I'm not really sure, but so yeah, they're basically they what they were looking at is ever since we kind of stepped down from the trees and started walking around on two legs, as it were, there's kind of been this theory or a sort of an accepted assumption that it's a bit of a dichotomy and once we started walking around on two legs and evolved bipedal physiology uh you know we've got we've got we can no longer have an opposable big toe we've got an arched arched foot we've got our fingers become straighter and so on it's kind of assumed that we no longer have that tree climbing ability yeah. well their point was if we look at hunter gatherers around the world that's clearly not true and so what they did is they actually quantified this in a few ways. They looked specifically at the calf muscles and found that because one of the things looking at, for example, the foot of Australopithecus, one of the very early pre-humans, yeah. is that their foot shape changes, their ankle shape changes. And that's generally assumed to mean that they can't move the foot back in a way that's necessary for climbing. Now, they went and they studied a group. I think it was a group of, it was either Agta or it was, no, I think it was Twa in the Congo. Mm -hmm. And they looked at these Twa and they found that they could compared to the pastoral populations nearby, they could shift their ankle back. It was purely a calf flexibility issue. It wasn't a bone that was stopping them. Mm -hmm. And actually their climbing was pretty much on a par with that of, certainly the ankle flexion was on a par with that of chimpanzees that were climbing and far beyond what us modern humans. I mean, it's the same, it's the same theory as how we look at people squatting and how mm -hmm. the Asian squat, a lot of us Europeans and uh, Americans can't do it. It's a similar sort of thing. But the point is that that was one very small aspect of it you can apply the same idea to many aspects of physiology. And even where we have changed, we've often found a way around it. So rather than grasping a log, for example, with our feet, because we can't do that anymore, we just place it against the tree and we lay back, as, it, as you would see someone maybe climbing a crack in climbing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I read that paper recently as well. And mm -hmm. you know, this, this is something I've been arguing for years. Because mm -hmm. you know, I, I I started training parkour uh, 15 years ago, and I kind of so I started studying anthropology on my own, like self-researching at 13 years old. Cool. So I read every <laughs> everything in my local library, yeah. and then I found a uh, uh, I found a mentor through local government who was uh, an anthropologist. Um, okay. who gave me access to his library. So uh, if I remember correctly, I'd read something like 30 ethnographic monographs before I entered community college at 16. Mm -hmm. So I had this huge kind of um, pool of ideas in my head about what people were actually like cross-culturally, which I think a lot of people don't. And, and, and as soon as I, you know, was, uh, was, was doing parkour, it was kind of like, Oh yeah, I can remember this, 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 sure. uh, this moment in Colin Turnbull's uh, The Forest yeah. People, where he talks about them booty pygmy and the games that they play. And it's like, ah, oh, this looks a lot like parkour. Yeah. Um, yeah. And my impression was that climbing remained a important foraging skill in many different uh, sure. Sure. foraging populations. Yeah, particularly um, rainforest groups. And it's also something that all kids are inherently attracted to doing. Like, it's clearly something yeah. that we have a facility for. So the idea that we just sort of stopped when we started using the terrestrial lifestyle. Um, it's a very binary idea. It's not very sophisticated. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I wonder to what degree, like, it seems like if you had better ethnographic knowledge, like, you, would, you would see that right away. Um, sure, and I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. And, and I'm not for a moment saying that the academic community didn't recognize it. It has very much been recognized. I think the big, the big difference is that it's seeing climbing as rather something that 
yes, we'll do it occasionally to forage. It's seeing it rather as a fundamental aspect of human locomotion, even past the point of bipedalism. Mm -hmm. And I think where, certainly with Vivek and Thomas's, um, their stuff, the big point they're making is that actually when we're looking at fossil hominins, such as Australopithecus and other, other individuals like that, the big point there is that perhaps we shouldn't be quite so hasty in inferring things in, about their behavior from the bones. But yeah, no, it's a funny one. It's one of those disconnects again, where you've got, you've got all these anthropologists who are writing about it, who are talking about it uh, into, from a sort of ethnographic foraging point of view, but the connection brought across to human performance is not necessarily made, I suppose. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think find interesting when you go back through the anthropological literature, uh, the paleoanthropological literature, is there's often this term, a mosaic of primitive and derived traits, right? Yeah, so, you'll see, so you might see a fossil hominin from, say, 2.2 million years ago or 3 million years ago that has quite modern physical proportions, right? And relatively short arms and maybe straight finger bones. And then you might see a fossil hominin a little bit later who... Uh, may have a more modern cranium, more modern face, but actually has longer arms and more hooked fingers. And this is always treated as, as very surprising in the anthropological record, but I think there's, there's really two obvious answers to that. One is that, you know, the types of environments that people are adapted to and the types of physical activities are variable across time that you're going to see variation. It's not, it's not, necessarily an ancestral trait so much as it is an adaptive trait to that environment yeah another and thing I think, I think with that same point it's also important to realize that and it, it, the the lineage of human evolution is not a single line we've got offshoots all over the place yeah. that didn't make it and so i think that's another point you know, you've got these mosaic of traits because we've got a mosaic of hominins often a lot of them alive at the same time mm -hmm. there's only one of us now but until very recently in evolutionary terms there were many of us yeah, and not only that, we, we know now that there was lots of uh, introgression between course, different lineages. Yeah. Yeah. Which, uh, I came up, you know, uh, my anthropological education happened, uh, you know, at the, at the beginning of the aughts. So that was the period when, um, when recent out of African origin was at its sort of apex of popularity, where it was widely believed that there was complete replacement of, uh, of non-modern human hominids when we we went out and uh, I actually did my, um, I, I never published it, but I was working on a thesis on comparing, uh, looking at wolves specifically, but also more widely to mm -hmm. look at lineages that you saw uh, intergression between different lineages. Because right at that time, uh, there was a ton of research coming out about the fact that coyotes and wolves were interbreeding on the sure. East Coast. And then we're now seeing all this intergression between those lineages. Um, and then I started looking at the research on hybridization more generally and realized that it, it showed up a lot and it didn't seem, yeah, to, yeah. It didn't seem to be something that people in the paleo who are having these arguments in the paleontological community were even aware of. Right? It seemed yeah, to be, sure. there was this, you know, cladistics basically creates these beautiful models where you have these branching trees and it's very elegant and uh, nice looking. Um, and it seemed like people had fallen in love with that and didn't realize that there was lots of data on the ground sure. Didn't There's really a lot of dotted lines between the end branches. Yeah, so you know you could yeah. you have two populations meet, and one has uh, a more modern style cranium, maybe, and one has a uh, more yeah. arboreal yeah. style. And I think also the other thing to remember is I know there's been a lot of research, particularly with human traits, um, that actually. A hell of a lot of our modern features, and it's very likely that this would have been the case in the past as well, is actually totally uh, is totally stochastic. It's complete chance, you know. And actually, there is there is a major suggestion that a lot of the differences in modern human features, the vast majority, eighty percent or so, and obviously it depends on the paper you read, is actually total chance, genetic drift. Particularly because we've had such small populations expanding here, and we're, for example, the peopling of the Americas, you know tiny mm -hmm. tiny group of people coming in through the land bridge of the Bering Strait is the standard theory and then they've expanded to fill all of the Americas that's a very small bottleneck you have the same probably coming out of Africa the same going down into Asia and, and Australia and so yeah. yeah I don't think those bottlenecks are are as tight and I think the the most recent theory with the Americas you have three you have three waves but all three of them are quite small the Nadine wave and then the, the Inuit or the last, yeah. but, um, but each of them is a, is a small founding population. Yeah. So um, what was I was going to say about that. 
when you, I, I, the, you know, for people who are not as familiar with this, that's, I believe, called neutral theory, right? Basically, drift is the, um, yeah. you know, drift is yeah. the primary oh. thing that differentiates populations. Yeah. But I think that's primarily at the, the level of the nucleotide, right? The genes themselves, right? Whereas uh, it's not as clear that sort of uh, um, phenotypic traits are driven primarily by drift. I sure. Think sexual selection or, or or selection for specific morphologies. No, absolutely. Lots of signals of selection. I think selection, since I was in university, selection has become uh, has has had a kind of uh, a rise in its um, in how much we think that it it contributes. Be it, you know, uh, like Henry Hawks and uh, Harpending had that paper, or John Hawks. And uh, Henry Harpending had that paper, uh, Acceleration uh, of Adaptive Human Evolution, which showed that there was a like a hundredfold increase in uh, positive selection across the genome um, post uh, uh, Neolithic revolution, which is quite an interesting finding. Mm -hmm. um, we're kind of getting into the weeds here, but I just find it very- Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I guess an, an, another interesting point on the same thing is, regardless of whether you're looking at it in terms of neutral or selection, you've also got to bear in mind that a lot of traits that before were adaptive, so for example, the situation of tree climbing versus not, we yeah. then start walking bipedally and say we don't really use it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily immediately mean that we lose the adaptations. You know, if they're not getting in the way, you're not necessarily going to lose them. And so you've also got to bear that in mind. Right. It's, yeah, you know, archetypes from previous selection. Yeah, yeah. Um, evolution is conservative. Um, yeah, absolutely. And it, it, you know, generally something that's not used will atrophy over time, but if it doesn't have a strong fitness cost, it's not going to atrophy immediately. No, it's not going to go from, from having, you know, he, so I think that the general history was the idea that, that primates had separated out from from other mammals about 60 million years ago. And then recently I've seen that yeah. pushed back to 90. And now I've seen some people now even speculating it goes back to 120 million years of specialization in trees. Yeah, I don't know. So, I mean, we're talking about- A long time. Extraordinarily <laughs> long period of time yeah, yeah. for arboreal animals, whether it's 60 million years or 120 million years, yeah, yeah. right? Like almost so much about us was yeah. derived from that adaption to trees. And I think that's one of the things that, yeah. that people who, talk about the ancestral health paradigm get wrong mm -hmm. if they choose this sort of archetypal um, environment of evolutionary adaptedness and they think about us as being just adapted to that rather than thinking about um, well, adaptions accrue over time and they're path dependent in, uh, to a degree. Sure, I mean, the point you're making, say, say, even, say even that it's 60 million years mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, we then split, our lineage split from the... Um, the other rest of the primate lineage yeah. around sort of five to eight million years ago we didn't actually come down from the trees until you're talking in a region of sort of earlier sort of three four probably more like two million years and so you know it's we've got maybe what like between two and five million years where we're walking around primarily and then we've got what 55 to 100 you know it, <laughs> a it's long, a long yeah, time it's um one, uh, here, here, I'm, I'm curious if you're up to date on this literature, but one thing that I was looking at, and I haven't looked at the most recent stuff on this, was uh, that there's some speculation that uh, knuckle walking is a secondary derivation that we see, it, it pops up multiple times in the lineage, but that the common ancestor of ourselves and uh, chimps and bonobos was probably, um, was probably an upright walker in trees. So mm -hmm. the vertical torso comes first, and you know we're grasping with the, that opposable thumb. Yeah. Actually, not real functional quadrupeds with knuckle walking, and then you have a split between you know a, a bipedal strategy and a knuckle walking strategy. Uh, what is your understanding about where that research stands now? Yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not up to date with it all it, actually currently, but yeah, I certainly certainly that idea that we became bipedal in the trees is definitely something that has been pushed more and more recently. Particularly orangutans seem to be a very good example of that. And, you know, they're another great native species. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, but particularly, you see also a lot of the time, they'll be even holding a branch above their head, perhaps, but still walking along a branch underneath. And yeah, there is this idea that perhaps actually bipedalism developed before we came out of the trees. 
And that would also fit very well with, say, Vivek and Tom's ideas of, and actually just with the way that hunter-gatherers walk around in the trees, the yeah. way that they climb, the way that they do things is very bipedal. Mm -hmm. um, even when they're going directly up a straight trunk, for the most part, typically, if, if it's a sort of standard diameter tree, they'll be putting their feet against it and walking up it in a layback position. Yeah. And um, yeah, it would fit very well. And certainly watching the, as I, I think I mentioned to you before, the Batek children, they move very similarly to the way you do your sort of tree parkour type stuff. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is, it's, it's walking along branches and it's, it's this surety of being able to balance and being able to move really quite fast up in them. Yeah. Um, I'm moving along. And I think the most, uh, just going off on a bit of a tangent here, the most incredible thing that I noticed with the Batek children is they'll be, and you were talking sort of six, seven-year-olds here, you know, really, really young kids. They'll be up sort of maybe 10, 15 meters high in a tree. And they'll be going out to branches so thin that they have to hold multiple ones with both feet and hands in order to actually stay in the branches. And yeah. they'll sort of grip them all with their toes and grip them all with their fingers. And they'll have sort of a whole bunch of branches. And that's what's stopping them falling. It's quite incredible. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's very much like how orangutans move, right? Mm, um, absolutely, yeah. So you're, you know, I, I, I did some research on the, the primate locomotion literature. And we, you mm -hmm. know, started applying some of those ideas to how we kind of conceptualize movement in parkour. But there's this idea of quadrumanus movement, four, four handed movement, um, mm -hmm. which we see, you know, especially we're talking about like orangutan movement where you're, you're distributing your weight across multiple small surfaces that couldn't handle such a large body primate otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, you know, my understanding is that the evolution of, of the vertical torso is probably in order to be able to take a larger body hominid and have it create more points of support um, throughout the branches. Because a monkey basically will quadrupedal down a branch. Yeah. 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 Whereas, uh, an ape has this capacity yeah. to reach over its shoulders and, and, and create yeah. multiple points of support that keep it um, less likely to, to, to create a fall. No, it makes sense. I mean, the, the evolution of human bipedalism is always going to be a contentious topic. Topic. I mean, there are so many different theories that all many of them, many of them are totally ridiculous. Many of them are very valid and seem to hold a lot of water. And that is certainly one of them. I think it's, I think it's certainly likely and it certainly feels, it feels right. Um, but I think we have all, you've got to obviously bear in mind that tree climbing is, has always been incredibly important. It, it may well be that bipedalism evolved initially in the trees, but once we did get down to the ground, whether we were knuckle walking or however we were doing it initially, there were massive selection factors to then become bipedal from that point as well. And I think, I, I guess the way I look at it is that tree climbing, you know, we have this idea in the anthropological, not as so much, in, but in the evolutionary literature, that tree climbing was perhaps became less important once we got down. I think the way I like to look at it, and this is, I'll, I'll admit, a very non-academic sense perhaps, but all of these aspects, whether it is particularly climbing and running or walking and load carrying with that, they're all key parts of the human locomotor repertoire. And I think if you add in things like particularly free diving is a key one as well. When, when you have indigenous people on coastal areas, they're almost always if the water is warm enough, they're always, always exploiting underwater resources as well. And then swimming obviously comes from that naturally. And I think, I think the important point here is that tree climbing is a very key part of that repertoire. And all of them together, yeah, go on. Oh, what struck me in what you were saying is that mm -hmm. I think there's a sort of myopia around bipedalism in, mm -hmm. in the way that we think about human motor capabilities that, yeah. uh, that's very kind of very specific to living in a world where all of the all of the environment has been paved for you right like yeah. we've we've created environments that afford us opportunities to spend as little time in anything other than walking and sitting as possible mm -hmm. right and and so it's easy for us to sort of we're we're kind of stuck in that box but so, you know, famously, there's this book, Born to Run, right? And it claims that, like, mm, it's yeah. essential yeah, yeah. adaption. And so I, coming from a, a, a background, having spent a lot of time also researching canids, I'm like, try to keep up with the dog, right? Like, if, if, yeah, yeah. if you're in a relatively flat, arid environment, and you run for a long time, eventually you'll exhaust your dog because yeah, it doesn't have the ability to sweat. Yeah. But, if, but go to the Arctic, 
and try to keep up with a wolf where they can do a hundred miles a day over terrain that you can't move more than like a couple mm -hmm. miles per hour. You can't do it. Like sure. in very specific environments, we're amazing distance runners. Yeah, but absolutely. Compared to the most highly adapted cursorial animals, we're still not that great in my opinion. Um, yeah. One, the one superhuman power that I think human beings are super, <laughs> I said superhuman, but super, uh, superpower that human beings have is throwing, right? Nothing else can throw yeah. nearly as powerfully or as accurately as we do. And that kind of is what makes us, what it initially made us such a, a powerful predator. But what's interesting about swimming, which you bring up is like great apes don't really swim. No, it's true. Um, and, and that plays to the idea that essentially one of the central aspects of human beings is that we're a generalist mover. We are, we are able to, to adapt. We could see basically mm, aquatic, semi-aquatic animals, and we could start to mimic and take on some of their adaptions yeah. or access yeah. resources that, uh, that chimpanzees don't have access to. Mm -hmm. that, that, that plasticity of motor behavior is in some ways maybe the most uh, profound yeah. aspect of the human motor adaption. I would agree with that for sure. Um, and I think, um, I think what you're saying there, the looking at, for example, hunter gatherer groups, which is always a good, and now yeah. it's very important to realize that hunter gatherer groups are not necessarily a model for our evolution back whenever, but they are still a good example of the human capacity when given a fairly natural environment. Now, again, most hunter gatherer groups are no longer in their natural environment, but for the most part, it gives a good indication. And if we look at, you know, putting evolution aside, the point is we're very adaptable in the form we are. You look at individuals who are in the savanna, the Hadza or the Sam, they are incredible runners, and I think almost more importantly, incredible distance walkers. Yeah. And then if you look at the rainforest, we've got incredible climbers, the Twa, the Mabuti, the, well, the Batek, and other groups, the Borowai. Uh, cool. And then you go, you go to the seas, and we've got the Bajau, we've got the Mokan, incredible divers, who are just, who are able to go deeper than, deeper than most non-aquatic mammals, and, and able to quite, Quite, I mean, most of their food comes from the sea and most of their fishing is done with spears at up to depths of around 40 meters. Admittedly, they're not mostly done that depth, but it's incredible. I was with them uh, back, in, back in March just before this all broke out and I had to come back, but I was just setting up some stuff to do with the Bajau. And watching these guys swim is just incredible. It's, you know, it's not just that they're able to go underwater. They have, been, they have figured out a way of moving without flippers mm -hmm. that is incredibly effective and incredibly efficient the way they do this sort of double kick thing, it works really, really well. And I think, yeah, well, I was gonna say, yeah, I think like you're saying, we're just incredibly good at adapting to the environment and being generalist locomotors, exactly. Yeah, and I think that the, the swimming thing is actually really interesting because um, it's actually an example of, of the power of human culture and how cultural adaptions empower this movement plasticity that we have. Because for instance, um, if I remember correctly, Europeans didn't know how to do the crawl stroke until they encountered Native Americans. Quite right. possibly, I don't know, but it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, yeah. So the so you so the breast stroke was essentially the only stroke that was mm. widely practiced. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the primary stroke that was widely practiced, and what people competed, you know, when they swam against each other in Europe. If I'm remembering the anthropology correctly, and uh, this is this is pretty vague, old memory. So if you're if you're watching this, take this with a grain of salt. But I believe that that uh, that the that the crawl when it was introduced by Native Americans and they were out swimming Europeans by you know massive amounts um, was like this revolution, and that shows how human beings can adapt. And when we look at something like climbing, um, what's striking to me about climbing is that it's like if you look at those layback climbs or those uh, foot pinch climbs, um, they're they're very closely related to the central pattern governors for quadrupedal movement, which developed very early in life. Um, mm -hmm. But swimming is much and yeah. the efficiency that people can get from swimming can continue to develop at a much higher degree. Like people are extremely bad swimmers innately. Yeah. Yes, um, absolutely. I, th I think ordinary ability to adapt. It. I think that's exactly the point. The reason that swimming is so remarkable is because it is so non-intuitive, and because of that, we can develop incredibly fluid, in fluid uh, ways of doing it, which are so beyond what you would naturally have. But as you're right, it's this cumulative culture that allows us to do that. And with climbing, it's definitely more intuitive, and probably, part, yeah, like you say, it's more quadrupedal. But I would add that there are certain so for example with the batek there are three main 
ways that they climb. All climbing together is known as Louis, that's their name for that. I mean, I'm going to get these the wrong way around, but they're three main words for the way they climb. They have uh, Chutwant, which is the standard one, which is where they are doing the layback technique. And you're right, that is very similar to a quadrupedal movement pattern. You then have uh, the Cooksank, which is where you've got a slightly wider tree and they'll, they'll take both hands together. They'll kind of like invert the feet and turn the hips downwards. So you've got almost like a diamond shape and sort of hop the feet up and then move the arms up, hop the feet up, move the arms up. And that that is, whilst admittedly it is a form of quadrupedal movement, it's certainly less intuitive to our hand arm swing. And so again, it's kind of finding a way to make it work. And and then finally, you've got much very similar to the chip ones, except it's called chun and it's done on um, rattan particularly. So very thin materials. And they'll actually use their big toes to grasp the uh, the substrate and then have the climb almost like a rope. So I have three children, right? So I have uh, my my oldest daughter is going to be eight in uh, in September. My son is going to be six in August, and then my youngest will be three in December. Um, okay. And you know, uh, I I owned a, or I didn't own, but I uh, I was the head coach at a parkour gym when my daughter was born, and then we've left that. But she was raised in part at the parkour gym, and then we okay. had beautiful rhododendron trees in our backyard that they've been climbing since they were little yeah. just like scampering through the canopies what of a childhood <laughs> <laughs> um and there's a couple interesting things about what i'm seeing with them like i they've come to parkour classes and i give them a little bit of instruction but i've also tried to like not try to put too much on too much technical development on them to just see what they like and what they choose to do my son in particular he like wants to come out with me when I train now and he wants to be part of it. Sure. So um, we went to a local park and I was watching them just, just climb this. Uh, it was a, it was just a, it was like a ladder. It was like a lifeguard station with a ladder and poles and they're climbing around all the poles. And I noticed that uh, my oldest daughter, she was, she was using the, the Hallux pinch Mm -hmm. big toe pinch like that uh w what did you call it yeah. um, like they used to call uh, they, they call it chun but in, in the literature it's normally known as halukal grasping so yeah, yeah very similar to and, and so. she, you know she had just completely intuitively adapted this climbing method and was able to do it with her toes which is really yeah. interesting and then um later that same day we went we found this really big beautiful kind of sprawled over willow tree and my son who's uh, you know five and a half uh he climbs up and just just without without any hesitation at all like you know stands up on this branch that's 20 feet off the ground and walks out into the canopy of this 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 tree and is just sitting there surrounded by the willow branches mm -hmm. completely confidently like yeah it's interesting really it, 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 it links back to this point you're talking about about the cultural side of things because actually when i went to spend the time with the batek and look at their tree climbing yeah. the phys the physical side of things was interesting and in working out how they did these things and comparing it to my own experience as a rock climber it's a it, you know it's interesting and they're a lot stronger in the places you wouldn't expect like their fingers are actually very strong which as a rock climber makes sense but as a tree climber you know you wouldn't necessarily expect but i think more the thing that i was most interested in was the way they think about their movement and in particular the psychological side of their climbing so the way they climb is you know by our standards incredibly dangerous mm -hmm. um, but i think there are three based on what i think i think there are three factors that allow them to be able to go and be so confident up there, you know, to switch from branch to branch without anything to hold on to, to climb incredibly high. Of course, none of them are roped at any of this time. I think one thing is, like you're saying, it's the culture, the way the culture looks at it. Um, and out with the Batek, you know, health and safety obviously isn't really a thing. Like I've seen a child fall from a tree about sort of maybe five meters up. And on the way down, he catches his ankle in a fork in the branch and sort of gets caught there and then falls again. And, you know, he's, he's, he's in a lot of pain. He's crying. And whatever. His father, who's currently playing football, turns over, looks at him, realizes that he's not dead. You know, he's OK. And then just goes back to playing football. And he's limping around for the next few days. But the point is that there is very little kind of indulgence in little hurt or, you know, upsetness about those sort of things. And so because of that, they, they become incredibly hardy. Like these Batek kids, you know, you can throw them and they bounce. They, they never get hurt, basically. Yeah. And I guess that the way I would kind of look at it is that as a hunter gatherer group and as, as the way we traditionally lived, yes, occasionally someone does die and it does happen. It's certainly with the Batek and other tree climbing groups, people do die, mm -hmm. but it happens so rarely that 
the rest of the time, you know, everyone develops incredible abilities because they're just, they're not taught to fear these things. And so because of that, they don't. You know, we in our world are very much, we're kind of taught to fear these things, taught that they're dangerous. And because of that, we worry about them and we, it becomes a problem. And I think that massively feeds into our ability or at least our perceived ability to do these things. Oh, Other yeah. things is, uh, yeah, exactly. And, and another, another factor is the fact that they are incredibly confident in their own ability, which is always going to be a factor. And another is the fact that they're constantly exposed to these heights, you know, that, that constant exposure. And I mean, you yourself, you, you good example of that, you know, you've exposed yourself, even from a Western yeah. background, yeah. you've exposed yourself to this over and over again, to the point where you don't fear it in the same way. Yeah, vertigo and, is adaptive, right? Like, um, yeah, absolutely, all these things are. And know, I think it's those, those three factors, it's constant exposure, a different societal perspective on these things, and just ability so practicing it to the point where you can trust your own ability and i think almost more importantly you're very in tune with what you can do and what you can't do yeah. and all those factors together even by the time you're a seven-year-old kid make a massive difference and then when it comes to scaling you know 50 meter trees for honey later on in life you know you're able to do it you're able to do that and you don't fear it in the same way or at least you can control that fear yeah we um in part in, in my little world of movement and parkour we've developed a distinction between uh the way we think about risk we divide it between risk and danger and, and risk is the likelihood that yeah, yeah. You know, and danger is the consequences if it fails yes. and what you learn to do is to is to essentially calibrate your your risk level very low when your danger level is high um yes so you you just you you stay closer to your limits when mm -hmm. the potential for for injury is higher and it's interesting because like there's been with my son, I was watching him as he was climbing this tree. And I was, I was shocked because it was, he's, he's been developing very, very quickly, right? Like mm -hmm. his movement potential, his movement abilities have been skyrocketing like really recently. Like there's just day to day, you'll see a uh, shifts in, in what he can do. Um, but as I was watching him, I didn't have a big sense of anxiety because he, there was no wobbles in his movement. Sure. Right he he was he was he was shockingly stable and balanced in in what he was able to do and his, he was he actually i think he's better than i am at the ability to shift between uh quadrupedal and standing really smoothly mm -hmm. and that ability to get down and up very quickly without any hitches is so critical to being able to move in positions very 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 confidently so there's he has that um which is really interesting and then um my daughter my youngest it's uh, to, to talk to the cultural point she's doing climbs at two and a half years old that the other kids didn't do until they were four and a half mm, four. Sure. she she just she sees them she's naturally quite assertive and extroverted yeah. so she probably has less fear than a lot of people by nature but but it's but some of it has to be just the fact that like sure. she has an avatar that's only this far ahead of her that she can chase yeah, yeah. i think i think it actually ties sorry to interrupt but i think it ties in quite closely to so quite a common um well, it's a bit it's slightly controversial, but it's gaining more and more acceptance in ultra running and in uh, sports science, this idea of the central governor, the idea that we have a perceived, or I guess our subconscious has a perceived point of what we're capable of doing. Mm -hmm. Or, for example, it, it knows, it, it reads the various inputs, and at the point where it thinks this is going to lead to damage or serious fatigue, it will start it'll start causing or serious exhaustion even it'll quite start causing fatigue to slow you down so you don't reach it and i think this comes to if you extend that model outwards and you have this idea that we it's almost a self-belief thing and it sounds a little wishy-washy but it's very much a thing of if you do not perceive yourself being able to do something or if society has put limits on you so that you truly believe that something is impossible it will always stay impossible mm -hmm. and i think this is exactly it if the society if either you're not exposed to that society and so you just don't know where the limits are theoretically you can take those as far as possible and there's that classic story of i think now i can't remember the details of this but it was about a, a rural african runner who had sort of come from nowhere suddenly competing against some of the best in the world you know the classic story from the kenyan type thing and there was one particular i think there was one particular race and a certain hour barrier had never been broken so like a 10 hour barrier or something like that yeah. And, you know, everyone would be told, it's impossible. You're never going to beat it. You know, it, it was just assumed to be impossible. The thing was, he didn't know that it was impossible and went and beat it when everyone else had tried for how long, you know, to try and beat it. And it's, it's this idea that with the back tech, you know, they do not see what they're doing as, frankly, even difficult. And so because of that, it's a lot easier to do. 
Yeah, yeah. The central governor theory, I mean, one aspect of that is that it's much more conservative than, it's designed to be much more conservative than the, the, the actual limitations. Not that there's not actual limitations. Like you can literally run yourself to death. Of course, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, like if you chase a cheetah for too long, it'll overheat and die. And that's, I mean, that's essentially what we do to, uh, or, or that's what persistence hunting is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can push an animal to kill itself by running. Uh, so there's a reason why your system's like, oh, you're getting close to overheating, we're going to shut you down. Um, yeah. But it, but rather than it being a real physiological limit, we have a a, a psychological limit. And that's without, exactly. and it's it's cultural and it's circumstantial, right? Like, all, yeah. you know, you you wash your mouth with carbohydrate and actually ingest none, and all of a sudden your your threshold increases. Sure. Well, this, I mean, this is the theory, isn't it? Central government yeah. feeds in a lot of different inputs. And one of those inputs is the societal perception of what's, what you're able to do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to, to, to highlight this theme of, uh, the hardiness. Cause I think this is quite interesting. Um, mm. are you familiar with Jonathan Haidt's work? Uh, you know, the coddling of the American mind. Uh, no, no. he's a social psychologist, but, mm. You know, he's talking about the polarization that we face in politics. And one of his theories okay. for why that is, is actually that kids don't get enough free play. Okay. He highlights a, a couple other things. It's, you know, uh, sort of ideological capture of the educational system by one side um, and it's social media. But, you know, the one that kind of overlaps with my work and your work is this idea that, uh, that when people don't get exposed to taking risk, don't get exposed to being under pressure, don't get exposed to dealing with fear, um, they become hyper-reactive to these things. Sure, and they become sure. not hardy, they become very sensitive, they feel threatened easily. And I think that this is, I, w I watch this play out all the time. And in, in the classic thing for me is, I think about this idea of, are you inculcating fear into your children or are you uh, inoculating them against fear, right? Sure. Um, and what I see all the time is a child falls down and the parents are like, oh my God, are you okay? You know, yeah, yeah. here's hugs, here's kisses, here's your boo-boo. Um, and, and what we're doing is rewarding them for having a negative emotion mm -hmm. through a fall. Yeah, and it's more than just them playing up. It's actually them being subconsciously imprinting on them that this is a bad thing. Yep, yeah, we're t they tune to the parent to tell them, is this actually scary or not? Mm. Um, and then the opposite is you can, you can, you can inverse it. So whenever my kids fall down, I say, good fall, right? And I, they say, you're okay, right? I don't say, are you okay? Yeah, yeah. You're okay, right? And if they say, I'm not okay, then, then I go to the comforting and the nurturing. Sure. But I always give them the, 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 the default to, to yeah. you, you've solved this and you're strong and robust yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think and that they can make an objective decision as to what is the deal. Yeah. And I think this is, is so important because we, yeah, I mean, you, go ahead. you see it. I, absolutely. I mean, you see it with the Batek the whole time. And obviously I, you should add here, I'm not suggesting that we all go back to a to gather a way of life. Of course, that's not, that's not sustainable in the society, but I think in terms of movement performance and in terms of performance in general, there is definitely something to be said for it in parallels that can be taken from it. So take, for example, about it. I mean, there's two levels. This is the hardiness thing. But there's also just the general capacity. Yes. So again, I've been out in the jungle with kids, you know, a group of, there was one particular instance where it was just me. And then a group of, I want to say like, maybe, I think we had a couple of old women were following somewhere behind, but it was mainly just a group of about sort of 12 to 15 year old kids. And um, we were out there and we, I can barely keep up with these guys in the jungle. We're all barefoot and these guys just dance through the stuff. Yeah. And, um, um, and, and not only am I struggling to keep up with them, as we're going, they have caught, by the time we stopped for lunch, they have caught about 30 fish while I've been struggling to keep up with them along the river that we've been following. And then we sit down and within the space of about 10 minutes, these kids, and it's a group of what, like eight kids, all, some of them 12 or younger, have put together a fire, they've put together a, a sort of whole carpet of leaves for us to sit on, they've started cooking these fish in bamboo. Within about 20 minutes, we have lunch. And, mm -hmm. and these are kids who, in our society, would not even be allowed out yeah. and on their own. And then there's this second point, is this hardiness thing. You know, I'm not joking when these kids bounce. I have seen, I've seen two kids cry. And actually, I was with in, in the Batek, and well, when I was with an indigenous group in Fiji, I saw one kid cry. With the Batek, it was a situation of the guy who fell out of the tree, 
and another one who I can't remember what, I think it was a load of other kids being mean to them or something like that. In Fiji, the only time I saw this kid cry, and this kid was, so I lived with a family and they had a kid who was probably only about five or six. And like, he cried once in the entire week and it was when he was put into a cold shower. Other than that, they don't cry ever. It's, it's quite incredible. Um, and when, you know, when, when they have an issue, they just walk off or they just go and do something else. It, it's they do not choose to react with fear, to a certain extent pain, or certainly when they receive pain, they do not react with negative emotion to the mm -hmm. same extent. And it, yeah, it's incredible, it's incredible. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be learned from that as far as uh, creating more hardy and stoic yeah. people. And I think like you're saying, you know, it's more than just hardiness, it's also actually your performance capacity is directly related to that as well. Yeah, yeah. And your ability to solve problems in general is, you know, not overreacting to them has a huge, sure. huge sure. impact on your ability to solve any kind of problem. Um, I wanted to just like uh, go back a little bit because, yep. you know, most of our audience, most of the audience for this has probably not read any eth ethnographic literature, mm -hmm. right? So when we say the Batek people are, are extremely well known in the ethnographic literature, that doesn't mean anything to the audience. Yeah. So I'm curious if you could just give us a little bit of a background about who these people are that you are yeah, researching yeah, yeah. and why they're well known in the, in the ethnographic they're, they're a really interesting group. Um, the thing that they are probably known for more than anything else is how egalitarian they are. So in, whilst obviously male and female will to a certain extent do different roles, there's obviously going to be some separation of roles. There is no, no real difference in status between male and female. There never really has been. And whilst most hunter-gatherer groups or a lot of hunter-gatherer groups are very kind of, that, you know, there's not, there's not a massively patriarchal society in the way that there has been more typically in the Western world and the more developing world. Mm -hmm. In hunter-gatherer groups, that doesn't tend, there are exceptions, like some of the Aboriginal groups, some of the Northwest and Native Americans were a little more. But for the most part, hunter-gatherer groups aren't. But what's interesting, but there is usually a very, very clear division of labor. So the women are usually doing the gathering, usually bringing in more food than the men actually with the gathering and are typically in the home, as it were, or typically because, and the, the evolutionary theory behind that is that essentially they are looking after the child, they're having the child, they are breastfeeding and so on. And so they cannot go running after animals and hunting while they do that. And yeah. then the men typically are out hunting, bring back normally less calories than the females, but they're kind of doing the, the that side of things. Mm -hmm. With the Batek, it's an interesting one. And the, the there isn't that same division of labor. There is still a division of labor, but it's much less so. And whereas in a lot of hunter-gatherer societies, you have this massive taboo between women using hunting tools and things like that. Often that's the case. With the Batek, that isn't the case. If the women want to use a blowgun, they use a blowgun. You know, there's not that same... Admittedly, it's changing now with a more Malay influence coming in. It, things are all changing around. But certainly traditionally, for example, the, the kind of the, um, the base ethnographic text on the Batek is, is written by a guy called Kirk Endicott, who him and his wife lived with them for about 40 years on and off. And um, yeah, and he, the, the book is titled The Headman Was a Woman, because it is just as likely for the women to be running the show as the men. And, but what is really interesting about the Batek is that I think it's because the, the main theory is because it's a tropical jungle environment, and the hunting and the gathering kind of be done at the same time. You know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit more blurred. You've yeah. got men and female, men and women doing very much the same thing for a lot of the case. And then the other reason the Batek are really well known is they're very, very non-confrontational. Mm. The Batek, even the group I was living with now, uh, so that, you know, I'm still, they're still as they are right now. They, a lot has changed, but they're still very similar in this respect. They do not have arguments. It just doesn't happen. Mm. The reason, the way they, deal with it is they they just leave you know if they if they have an issue an issue that can't be resolved they will just leave the village and they'll go and live somewhere else it's quite incredible and i watched it happen even the time i was there there was one particular individual individual who very much wanted to marry another individual mm -hmm. and they didn't want to in return and so the girl just left she just shifted to another village and typically there are lots of area villages kind of in close links with each other and what, where, where you see it in the most, the most extreme variation of this is when you watch parents working with their kids. Now, obviously, they're very young. They're kind of controlling what they're doing. But even parents to kids, there's very little coercion going on. You will typically have a parent will try to persuade their kid to do something, but they will never really, for the most part, tell them what to do. It's much more a persuade them to do something. And if they want to do it, they'll probably just go do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Even the headmen of the village, uh, it's like you have a slightly different system now. You have something called the Batin headmen who 
they were actually brought in by the Malay government, and that's all a slightly different thing. But the traditional headman structure, they again, it wasn't a deal that the headman typically, or headwoman for that matter, controlled the village. It was just that they were the most respected and looked up to and decisions were asked of them. There was no real, there's no hierarchy, there's no I am in charge of you type thing. It just doesn't happen like that in the Batek. And that's kind of why they're most well known. Uh, what, what's the kind of typical group sizes for the Batek? So, I mean, as a, obviously it's changed a lot now, um, but typically when they were living around in the jungle, you would have, I don't know exact numbers, but I would imagine something around sort of 100 or so. But the key point is that that would change throughout the year. So when you've got fruit season, they might all come in fruit season. It was absolutely massive. When it's fruit season in the jungle where, where in Malaysia, that's all you eat. You just eat fruit, basically. And that'll go on for a few months. And so at that point, the whole group will come together. But the most part, they'll sort of splinter off into different smaller groups and they'll go off, they'll go foraging over here, these guys go foraging over here and so on. And even if you look at the structure now and the group I was with, they have actually been, they are now living in a permanent government village. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's kind of, there's arguments as to whether that, you know, it's not necessarily their choice. They've kind of been put yeah. in there, but we won't go into all of that. But even now they have about three other villages of bamboo structures elsewhere that they'll kind of, they'll have a permanent group here, a permanent group here, they'll fluctuate between it. Half the village might just go off to the jungle for a few days and they'll spend that, spend a month there and then they'll move off. And they're all linked with other Batek groups in the area. So it's very, very fluid. Um, the group I was living with were probably in the region of, I want to say maybe 120 or so. But from what I'm aware, they were actually two villages historically that were put together. So I don't know exactly what that would have been. Um, but I think it, it's very, very fluid. They fluctuate a lot depending on the season. Yeah, because there's that that classic anthropological theory that you basically have like band level societies, which essentially have no formal hierarchy. And then you have tribal societies where you get that that big man who um, who who ends up being able to influence a lot of things through tr trading favors, but doesn't really have a formal right of veto yeah, totally. over other people and then you get a tribal society or a um a chiefdom type society where where all of a sudden you have you know a structured hierarchy where the 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 chief is able to tell people what to do and they're expected not to do it and he has the right to use force to compel things yeah, Obviously, yeah, yeah. state level societies above that or post-state yeah. societies um and, in and a it's, lot often, of it's often linked things. to resources that can be stored as well yeah. is when you have food sources that can be stored for example like what well, i mentioned the northwest yeah. uh, coast Next yeah, America, because they have the salmon run and yeah. so with the salmon run you can store food all year and that develop, once you've got material wealth you'll then start having hierarchy because people have more than others and people are storing things whereas the batek batek and material possessions it just doesn't work you know mm -hmm. the women might have a digging stick end a metal digging stick end the men will have their blowpipe other than that they don't really recognize material ownership they'll share like a couple of them might have a motorbike that they go use in the malay villages they won't, they won't really think of it as mine or yours. They'll destroy it quite happily. You know, there's very little understanding of material possessions, certainly very little caring for it. So I'm curious to hear more about your, your direct experience, right? So we've talked about kind of the big anthropological picture, the evolutionary picture, and now a little bit about the, the ethnographic background. So you went very curious about climbing. And, and one thing you mentioned in the article is that it was kind of hard to see the climbing because the, yeah. um, the, the, the environment in which they are living has been manipulated and turned yeah. into something that wasn't no, of, the, of the traditional mm -hmm. lifestyle. So, um, yeah, just give us a little bit of a, I, I'm curious to hear the story of your experience of the Batek. And, and yeah, so, yeah. yeah, so I'm, so obviously I went into it all having read this book, the headman was a woman, the typical mm -hmm. one where Kirk and his wife, they go and live literally with a Batek group in the middle of Tamanagara, the big forest there. And it is as they, typically were. This particular group that I lived with, they, things have changed a little bit. So anyone over about the age of 20 can remember living in the jungle fully. You know, they are, they are totally jungle dwellers. They do not have any real, they, they'll have had interaction with the outside world, but not massively. You know, they, they live their own life. They have now moved into, so what happened when the British, when there was the war, I believe with the Chinese, um, the British were out there, there was, the indigenous people are obviously a massive asset to both sides because they could move around in the forest, they know the way, all this sort of stuff. Now the British, in classic colonial style, they put as many of the indigenous groups into set concrete settlements as they could. The idea being that they then knew where they were and they could kind of have them on side. 
Now, when the British left, that was taken over by the, and this, at least this is my understanding of it, that was, and I don't quote me on this, that was then taken over by the Malay government. And the Malay stance at the moment, and I, I'm pretty sure, I don't want to say this for definite, is that they want to convert the Batek to Islam. And, and in doing so, they, for example, there is a mosque built into each village and there are local imams that will come and visit the village every so often. Now, the Batek, at least the Batek I was living by, and again, I don't want to put a sweeping statement over this, but the one, the group that I was living with, they are still very strong in their traditional beliefs. And so whilst they are now living in this village, they still branch off into the jungle and some of them will go for a couple of months and so on. That's becoming less and less, even in the period of the last sort of five years or so, they're living far less in the jungle than they used to. There is still a, for a, for a second there, because I think that uh, there's a, there's an interesting thread here that kind of connects some of, some of the ideas that are, they're going through this channel. But um, can you tell us a little bit about their traditional religion? And I'm curious about the, the connection between their traditional religion and the kind of the physical lifestyle that they live. Yeah. So again, this is a difficult one because, because I've only lived with them for about three months. There's certainly what I've seen is definitely not a complete picture of what's going on. And to a certain extent, the Batek, they are known as being, a very friendly group, but also a very shy group. And so I'm under no illusion that what I, the time I've spent with them, I'm not seeing a lot of what's going on in the background. And as I, even as I've spent time with them, suddenly things will pop up that are very clear have been going on the whole time, but I haven't seen until that point. Uh, tree climbing is a good example. Mm -hmm. And with the religion, so the traditional religion with Batek, it was, a, it was animism. So they believed, I think in two gods, a god of the sky and a god of the ground, but then there were spirits everywhere else. Um, and they would do, so the Batek were quite, Weird, strange in terms of traditional society. You think of a lot of traditional societies, they always have some form of music or singing and dance and so on. The Batek traditionally did a lot of that in, in a sort of worship form. Mm -hmm. The Batek I've spent with, you never see them do any form of music. And now I did hear one at one point, there was a guy who was telling me, you know, if you stay long enough, you can come and see one of the singing ceremonies. Um, speaking to other people and what I believe, they still have quite a significant form of worship that goes on in the forest certainly with the older generation in this form of singing ceremony. The one thing that is very clear that they do do very much to do with their religion is that, and this used to be a male and female thing, it's become just a female thing, is they will fill their hair with flowers to the point where it is all overflowing, literally overflowing with flowers. Um, I can, I might even be able to put a picture up. I don't know. Yeah. Can you share exactly. screens on um, I, I'm going to have to make you a host for a second, but uh, it, just give me one second. Here we go. But, but yeah, no, it's quite incredible uh, how much they will fill the hair with flowers. Okay, cool. Yeah, you can you can throw uh, share your screen now. Okay, hang on a moment. Let me just find what, an example. So you can see you see how they'll. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah. Yeah. So they will they will they will fill their hair with uh, flowers, and it's a form of worship for the forest. And this is one of the much older women. So this this woman, for example, she must be sort of in her sixties, seventies now, and she has grown up her entire life in the, in the forest. And it is very obvious because her and the other older women, they, they, will, um, they will still live very much that way. They'll be out every single day in the forest. They will be foraging. That then they live, if you, the village that they live in is you've got these sort of set government sort of concrete houses, totally empty shells, which each family will kind of live in, although again, it's very fluid. In between each of those, they'll have built a bamboo house for new families. And these women will literally just live in these kind of like half traditional shelters, maybe with a sheet of corrugated iron on it. They still live very traditionally. And, um, and so, yeah, you've got, you've got kind of this, this kind of weird sort of double life in the village where you've got both the new, the new influences from the Malay society and more and more from the Western society as well. Um, mainly through sort of, you know, there'll be the old phone will pop up. There's a couple of televisions in the village, things like that. And so they're learning more and more about that side of things. Um, quite often with a lot of confusion, there's a classic story that a guy told me where um, the, they've been watching a cartoon on the television and they came up to him very, very worried saying, this isn't real life, is it? You know, <laughs> I, was, I was asked whether zombies existed, all these sorts yeah. of things. But, yeah. you know, so there's this weird double life. And at the moment, they are totally capable of living entirely in the jungle if they so please. But unfortunately, because it's becoming less and less frequent that they're doing it, the kids are not learning it to the same extent. Whilst they're incredibly capable, 
at least from what I've seen, I would be very surprised if this particular village, and admittedly there are many Batek groups, many who are still living very traditionally in the jungle, I would be very surprised if this traditional village, if this particular village even, in the next couple of generations is living in the jungle much at all. I may be wrong, but I, I, I think it'll be visits rather than living. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's uh, sad to contemplate. Um, it is sad, yeah. Yeah. I, I asked the question about religion because um, there's a kind of interesting thread that's happening through some of the conversations that I've been having. Mm -hmm. I have a conversation I'm going with uh, John Verveke, who's the director of cognitive science at the University of Toronto, and my friend Simon Thacker, who teaches ancestral movement in and uh in australia and one of these ideas is is how much in many traditional societies physical culture is actually very attached to religion and mm -hmm. it's attached to ritual and like animal mimicry and song and storytelling all these things are kind of very tightly aligned sure. um, and so i was just I was just curious to hear a little bit about that. Um, so, I mean, I also think, you know, just generally, the more we understand about yeah. this, the more interesting it is. Yeah, no, sure. I think, I think I would not be surprised if there's a lot more of that. And I'd have to reread the book. I think traditionally, probably a lot more of that would have been going on. And certainly there is, there is a very deep, so whilst I didn't really see a lot of that, I would imagine it's probably because I wasn't, I didn't hang around for long enough. I would imagine it would take a couple of years, a good integration before you get to the point where you'd really see what's going on with that respect. Um, but what you definitely do see is this very, very deep respect and knowledge of the natural world and the animals and plants around them. So you're out there with the, with the, these old women, for example, and you'll hear a hornbill go, a particular type of hornbill will sound off. And they'll tell you that that means that the rest of the tribe is still safe. And so there's clearly, there is still that sort of understanding of what's going on, um, you know, and different things will tell you there are elephants coming or whatever and that sort of thing. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, you know, it's like, the, for example, when I went, I went there, so the final time I went to visit them back in December, I went with a guy called Shane Benzi, who is a movement specialist who works with ultra runners. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we went and camped, not wanting to go and live in the village itself, just because I didn't want to strain relationships with him, not having known them in advance and yeah. so on. We went and camped in a nearby bit of jungle. And they told us beforehand, no, don't go there. There's elephants there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the elephants are very rare around here. And we're thinking, yeah. the, you know, I, I hear a lot of these sort of things. There's a bit of them kind of thinking, you know, that's that. I just kind of think, yeah, they're just getting scared. Because it is, it is a fact that a lot of the younger individuals in the Batek are becoming quite scared of the jungle as well which is even sadder to see. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we go there and uh, three days later in the middle of the night, a whole herd of elephants walked through our camp. And I was, was they honestly probably the most terrifying experience of my life. They absolutely destroyed the shelter next to me and it was quite an experience. But um, yeah, they, they, yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> but but it was, uh, yeah, you know, they were right. And I guess I shouldn't have been, uh, I shouldn't have been second guessing them. But the point is, it wasn't a situation of we've seen footprints, we know there's elephants there. It was almost this second sense that, you know, there are elephants there. I can't tell you why, but there are elephants there. And that is, that, that boundary between total awareness of what's going on around them, what's going on in the ecosystem around them, the boundary between that and something spiritual and something kind of more ritualistic is quite difficult to define. Yeah, this is this really hits uh, uh, some themes that I've been thinking about. So um, I, I want to kind of unpack some of what I've been thinking about because I think it might 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 be a, an interesting grounds for for generating some insight from what you've experienced. But uh, so you said the hornbill, right? She can mm -hmm. hear the hornbill call, and the hornbill tells her um, that the, the the tribe is safe. That's yeah. quite an interesting moment. And then yeah, they I, don't, I don't know whether it's a hornbill. Sorry, I don't know whether it's the hornbill is telling her or whether it's just that she, the hornbill signifies it. I, 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 don't, I don't know whether she's necessarily saying that it's directly yeah. telling her. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I've been reading a bunch of different things and, and encountering John Ravakey's work and uh, I've, been, I've been fighting with the concept of spirit, right? That's one of the things. Because mm -hmm. I, I feel like when people in the West talk about spirituality, it's kind of just a fudgy thing that... Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can talk about the secret and you'll just manifest whatever you want. And people use it, they use it sort of in a way that is, um, is very epistemologically unsound. Um, but maybe there's something there that uh, that captures a, an, uh, an element of reality that we may be even blind to that's actually very valuable. Oh, and, sure, yeah. and so I was reading a book called um, What the Robin Knows by John Young. 
Yeah, I know the book. I have it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that book is about bird languages. And at the same time, I was reading another book called uh, Spell of the Sensuous by David Abrams. Okay. Um, and the idea that I had, a so in, in the Spell of the Sensuous, David Abrams says, at our base level of sensing the environment, our base sensual experience, we are all animists. Mm -hmm. I was talking about the animist perception of reality. And then I put that together with, with, uh, with the stuff I learned from Reiki and, and then what I was reading in John Young. And I realized that like there's one, one thing that I'm very interested in is this idea that, that there's, that the, the, the world that we move through in the West is stripped of a lot of meaning, right? Yes. Absolutely. So, so we feel alienated and disconnected and this is a major problem. This is why a lot of us have depression and, and, and anxiety and all these things. But, you know, this is the ancestral health, but like not just your gut biome, but actually like what's yeah, yeah. No, your, no, your medic yeah, yeah. biome, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so, um, so I, I, you know, I start parkour and when I'm 23 and I, all of a sudden, all this urban architecture that has no meaning, that is just ugly, to walk past becomes imbued with this sense that I can move through it and that it affords me all of these interesting yeah, movements. Very interesting. And it's like falling in love with the world. And then later I then take that movement and I, and I go into the woods, which I've always been a kid who grew up in the woods and loved the woods and loved nature. And all of a sudden my relationship with a tree is that that tree affords me the potential to do these movements and that that makes it very meaningful for me. And then later I get into nature connection stuff through some of my students. And now it's like, now I know that that tree also affords fibers that you can use to make this, or it's, it's a source of tinder, or this is what the wood is good for. This are the animals that live in it. And I start saying that like, we feel like the world is meaningless yep. because in, in essence, we're, we're, we're illiterate in the meaning that is embedded in most of the world. Mm -hmm. yeah so um i i <laughs> there's quite a big thesis for me to unlay so I, i'm gonna i'm yeah. not gonna say everything because it would no, take me it would take me a long time so i'm just curious to hear what yeah it, it's here. interesting you touch on this stuff before i found uh sort of ultra running and rock climbing i was very big into this nature connection stuff as well and it was my first interest in indigenous societies was the survivals because that was why i first went to the bad tech not survival is a bad one but people know what you're talking about when you're talking yeah. about that sort bushcraft of thing. nature connection. yeah exactly that sort of thing and the one that has always intrigued me more than anything is animal tracking and it's when you see someone who is a good animal tracker tracking, you know, they can see things that you cannot even see. And I would go so far as to argue that you, they can see things that you cannot even understand, let alone see. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly this thing, this, this, again, this boundary between the scientific uh, sort of understanding of awareness and what is, to many people, they consider the spiritual realm actually maybe they're one and the same thing in many of these places yeah. and i think i think animal tracking is a very good example and i should add here that i'm very making a very careful distinction between spirituality and religion religion being the following of ritual uh, potentially for the purpose of spirituality versus spirituality which is almost a deeper understanding of the world around us and certainly in movement we can see that spirituality you, you the the scientific state of flow i would argue to many people is what they consider spirituality yeah, you know? this is this is very much along the lines of uh, of what Verveke talks about, right? Where flow is f flow is the same phenomenon as enlightenment in a sense, but uh, at a different at a different kind of in scale. Sure, sure. Um, and it's also how you define these things. I think yeah. I would I would I would um I would offer this this idea, which is that um, religion can be divided between religio which is the things that connect us deeply to things, right? That afford us connection and dogma, which is, um, which is specific propositional beliefs that you have to adhere to. Um, and spirituality we could see as, as, as part of religio. I don't know if all that religion does is just give you connection to spirituality, but we could see spirituality as essentially that ability to tune into these layers of meaning. Um, what, what I realized when I had that current, that like I always, I, you know, I joke that I, I'm going to become religious and not spiritual because everyone says they're spiritual, not religious. But um, what, what, because of the way that it's used. But then I saw that this idea that if, if you're listening to the bird's languages, the, that, that what you end up tuning into is a neural net of 
composed of the individual actors of birds, right? Because it's not just the individual bird. You're listening to the voice of the whole forest that's telling you the state of the forest through the birds. And so the bird, and in, in some sense, an animist, an animistic way of looking at that is to treat that as an agent. And that, and so you think of that as the spirit of the bird, and the spirit of the bird is telling me that there's danger in the forest, or the spirit of the bird is telling me that it's safe in the forest, or this is a place that elephants come through. Um, and that may not be accurate in the sense that that has an objective consciousness the way that we have an objective consciousness, but it may actually be the most effective way, the most pragmatic way for someone like the Batek to, to interact with their environment. And, and in a far more effective way than we do as well, interestingly yeah. enough. To, to, to go to the tracking example, this is really, I think it's incredibly yeah. fascinating. This gets to the conversation I'm having with Simon as well. Uh, the best way in some sense for a, a hunter to become very efficient at catching something is to imagine the spirit of that thing and to model it closer and closer to reality to the point that um, it's this emergent, it's almost like an emergent, it's an emergent consciousness within their consciousness that they can tap into yeah. and access. And you, you look at the videos of say the San Bushman tracking and they, they do exactly that. You know, they'll have a sign for each animal and they become the animal is the way they place it. And through doing that, they can view the world around them with and adding into that a massive knowledge of that animal's behavior. They can view the world the way the animal does and they know it, you know, points where the tracks dry up, they can follow it because they know what the animal would do. It's almost tapping into that consciousness. And whether you, whether you want to view that on a spiritual kind of um, beyond psychological dimension or whether you want to view that as just an intense awareness and understanding of the animal is kind of irrelevant. The point is that they have this much greater awareness. And the, the point, I think it's, it's an interesting one and it's a parallel that I always want to bring back to movement actually, because and, and a very good example of this is yoga. And it's something that until I started free diving and started training free diving, it's something I avoided like the plague because of all this perspective, all this, sorry, not perspective, all of this, um, what's surrounding it you know in our day-to-day -day world the way we perceive it the way our society looks at yoga and how much of it is sort of fad driven and so on yoga is a very interesting story it is it is and i don't want to get into it too deeply <laughs> but i i was lucky enough to first kind of experience it and first be taught it by a community of freedivers rather than yoga practitioners i i, I guess one and the same but the point being that i was taught from a very anatomical and then scientific point of view and my understanding my understanding of yoga is that yoga is simply the the fusion of both mind and body and under that understanding any of these movement forms whether that's ultra running rock climbing free diving they are all yoga now mm -hmm. yoga in the form that we think about it is in, in the western world is typically divided into what they consider asana the movement forms and then the meditation and mind forms mm -hmm. but those two themselves are in many ways tools to reach this mind body connection the highest level of mind body connection as far as i'm concerned is flow and in and flow and then also these aspects of awareness and things exactly what we're talking about and that can be that can be looked at across the entire spectrum of human potential whether that's locomotion performance or whether that's things like awareness and animal tracking and it's interesting that and I, I, you know, this is perhaps a completely unrelated parallel, but it's interesting that it is thought that long distance running and our evolution for that, both physiologically and psychologically, evolved hand in hand with animal tracking as the origin of human scientific thought. You know, it, it, it's interesting how it all fits together. And I think the thing that people miss, perhaps with, and I'm no expert on this, but the thing that I think a lot of Western and modern yoga misses is that it is far beyond the dogmatic principles and rituals of asana and it is actually a much bigger idea and the asana or what it, or the meditation is purely a way of training that fusion of mind and body for a higher purpose of general control of the body in whatever aspect that is to be done mm -hmm. yeah um i i have had a real hesitation around yoga both my parents were yoga teachers at one point mm -hmm. but Yoga in, in its cultural context is a branch of Vedanta, which is, you know, what we call Hinduism. It's mm -hmm. a specific spiritual religious path. Yeah. And the asana is a very small part of it. Yeah. Much of which was probably a, created quite late, derived mm -hmm. from Western physical culture. Um, 
and that so there's always this weird thing and then the way that it, it is hybridized with western ideas of spirituality and theosophy and all that um it always i always have this little thing about it but um but there but i think if we look more deeply into it from below that surface layer again we discover uh the power of these tools of mind body integration mm -hmm. and and some of these same themes that come up here one of the things that's popping into my mind is if we go back to the idea that that the Malay want the Batek to convert to Islam, um, think of culture in some sense as as an as a as an interface that we create that allows our biology to effectively um, operate itself through in relationship to a specific ecological and economic environment, right? And uh, we often don't realize how much when we take one piece of it out, we destabilize the whole structure. Sure. And I, and I think about this, this idea that if you, if, if you have a, a, a specific view of spirituality that comes from, you know, whether it's evangelical Christianity or Islam or, or, or Vipassana, right. Um, that if, if you try to, to graft that directly onto an indigenous mindset, how much that itself can destabilize, right? Like they, they may need this sense of animism that's viewed as incorrect from a, from a monotheistic thing in order to operate the cultural tools that they come. Yeah. From. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's with, with something like an indigenous society or indigenous, perhaps not the key point It's something with a tribal society, a society that is living off the land in a more traditional sense, um, separating that from indigenous, just being people who, originally come from an area those that are still living in a in a not even necessarily hunter gatherer but hunter horticultural or whatever you know traditional sense the it is i would argue and uh, fear of being perhaps as being slightly controversial i would say that their form of religion is perhaps more entwined in the way they live than western ideas or even some eastern ideas of religion in that you take christianity or islam or hinduism for the most part, they are kind of, whilst it may be the overarching uh, philosophy of someone's life, it is kind of something that could just be fitted onto any existence in the modern world, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in indigenous culture, the, their anim, an, animalistic, sorry, animistic or whatever form of belief system they have is usually integrally entwined to the way they live. So with the Batek, it's, it's, their their belief system is literally the way they live in the forest or the bajal their belief system traditionally at least is literally the way they live underwater and live with the water and you know even to the point that for example when that 2004 tsunami came through the bajal or no the mokken sorry the mokken on the surin islands around thailand they actually saved a hell of a lot of tourists because they were operating as boat operators they read the signs in a way that the others around there couldn't do and went straight out to sea and saved people through doing that. The point being that these societies, the religion is so entwined in the way they live that it is one and the same. It is not, it cannot be separated, you know, whereas in the Western world, I can be completely agnostic. I can be completely athe atheistic or I can be Christian or Islamic or whatever. And it all fits, right? It can all work. And I think that's that separation. Now myself being not particularly religious, I think it's this separation of, with the indigenous society, it is one and the same as the way they live. In these modern forms of these religions, and again, modern's not the right word because these people are modern too, but these Western forms or, you know, developed forms of religions, it is more of a ritualistic understanding of a philosophy that can be applied to a lifestyle, I suppose. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with the work of the cognitive anthropologists around religion, like Scott Atron and Pascal Boyer? No, no. I, I have to say, I, this is this is this sort of stuff I haven't looked at academically yeah. at all. This is more kind of look at it. It's interesting. I, I need to read it more deeply myself. Mm. But one of the things that they kind of, one of the ideas that I take from their work is basically that um, we have what you might call a religious impulse. They attribute it to um, you know an overactive agency system, right? Uh, right agency detection which perhaps in hunter forger uh, context is not overactive at all but quite appropriately yeah. active. And i wonder uh, if some of the modern religions are kind of a you know building more on it because it isn't there but but one of the key ideas within this is that that system that or that that impulse 
is a very powerful psychological hook that then you can uh, you can propagate social technologies or social structures through more effectively. And we, 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 what social structures get hooked to that impulse can be quite variable from culture to culture. And so we tend to think of religion as this one thing where you're just sort of like swapping out the God that you believe in, or, you know, maybe some specific commandments, but it's actually a much more complex and variable kind of uh, cultural software. Um, yes. And um, so if that's the case, um, Western religion in particular, Protestant Christianity has carved off a ton of what religion is in order to make it more cross compatible. So you can be a Catholic or a Muslim or a Christian or a Buddhist, but it, it essentially like what we're doing is we're asking everybody to be a Protestant variant of those things and to place religion in a very specific place in their overarching uh, cultural technology, which doesn't necessarily map to these situations. Um, so I think it's a quite interesting thing. And I, um, I won't ask you to comment that. I, I have to jump off here very quickly, but I wanted to just touch base on one, one more thing, which is um, within the natural movement community, right? People who are interested in movement, there is a kind of, uh, let's say a, a growing intrigue around, um, around these questions of meaning and religion and philosophy. And one of the, the impulses is to return to animism, right? Right. And, and there's a, there's a, there's a layer in which, um, to understand and see the world through that indigenous perspective, you have to be able to understand that. But there's also a layer in which we are still, we're still in the West, right? We're still within our technological society that descends from all these things. And I think a lot about this idea of where we're trying to integrate those, right? Um, we're trying to integrate some of the principles that have made Western society very successful but we've lost all these senses of meaning. And um, yeah, I'm just, I guess, having spent time with the Batek, I'm, I'm curious to, 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 to put that idea to you. As we think about taking on ancestral skills, whether it's nature connection, whether it's natural parkour, whatever it is, um, and those skills were themselves, like if you're talking about, uh, if, you're, if you're learning Tai Chi, that's a Taoist practice. If you're learning uh, Shaolin Kung Fu, that's, a, um, that's a, a Buddhist practice. And if you're learning yoga, that's a Vedantic practice. Um, and yet we have Protestantized all those things yes. as they've come into the West. And there's something that gets weird about the fact that we don't see the the thing it was embedded in so yeah let me uh, <laughs> run yeah. with that as, a, as my last question it's, it's not exactly a question it's yeah it's certainly not one i've considered before um but <laughs> <laughs> i think i think my perspective on it would be that it doesn't necessarily ultimately yes there have been all these different belief systems all these different ways of reacting to an environment in in terms of the way you psychologically perceive that and so on but I would add that the way we move and the way that we perceive the environment from a, for example, the point of view of awareness and tracking and that side of things is so deep in our evolutionary systems that I don't think it necessarily has to be attached to any form of belief system. Mm -hmm. I would argue that it's like this example with the yoga. Sure, it may have originally come from a certain area of religion, but the concept of mind and body mind and body fusion that is a concept that is deeper than the religion that it, it that it was kind of i guess first pushed forward from if that makes sense yeah. and so because of that i i guess you could almost see it as you have all these different religions dogmatic practices rituals perspectives on beliefs beyond all of that is this kind of umbrella of human adaptability in locomotion and in movement that is almost its own religion on a deeper, I don't use the word religion, almost its own spirituality, a, a form of being on a deeper level than that. What I think way of the, being. Animal, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the animal tracking is a very good example because look at, for example, the Sam Bushman and the way they track. Sure, they have all their own, um, and I don't know details of the Sam's belief system, but they will have their own ritualistic dances and their own, their own belief system that surrounds that tracking and 
much of that belief system will have arisen from the to aid them with that tracking without a doubt certainly the parts which are surrounding the tracking the way they become the animal and the way they honor the animal and the way they do that but i don't think that that necessarily has to clash with any form of belief or that there's any belief that is a prescription for that because i think ultimately the way you perceive the way it's going to sound silly but the way that you perceive the perspective you use to approach these things so the way you perceive the way you get into the animal's head when you track can be perceived from many different ways it can be perceived from a religious angle it can be perceived from a purely scientific angle it can be perceived from a spiritual angle and which one you use doesn't really matter ultimately they're all for want of a better word, placebos to create the same effect. And I think you can have the same thing with movement. You know, the way that Batek climbs, sure, there are probably, and I don't know the details, but there are probably belief systems associated with that. But ultimately, they are tapping into the same sort of the same um, control of the body and awareness of space and awareness of how they're interacting with the substrate they're climbing on as Alex Honnold when he climbs El Capitan or or the yoga practitioners of India when they're performing complex movements in inverted positions, for example. And so I would, my own belief perception, I guess, on this is that there is something, all these, all these spiritualities and certainly the dogmatic, wrong word, the ritualistic perspectives of those, such as religion, as we currently see it, whether that's indigenous or, or Western, um, in, in industrialized societies, where was I going with this? They, uh, <laughs> all of those, re regardless of which way you're looking at it, it all comes underneath it is a more, I can't remember what I was going to say with the sentence, but the point being that there is a deeper, a deeper um, a kind of, the way we do this is all kind of the same underneath. And the, depending on and how you perceive that, the different religions and so on, is just different ways of, being able to harness the same idea is my perspective. I would argue that something like flow, that mind-body connection, that a high level of awareness is something that is, is more basal in the human psyche than belief systems that fit with religious practices and so on. Yeah, I, I think this is a conversation we'll have to go deeper into. Uh, I think there's, there's some very interesting things around yeah. treating, treating these ideas as psychotechnologies that afford insight in specific ways um, and how we integrate them. Um, but uh, I actually have someone else coming on the call in like two minutes. So, um, so I'm going to have to, we'll have to pick it up. I would also really love to hear more about, you know, experiences with really seeing how they, uh, people in other cultures climb and how they move. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel like we could have gone deeper into that and it'd be very interesting for me. So perhaps we'll be able to pick it up and have another conversation. Sure. No, it'd be good. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you very much, George. Thanks for listening to the Evolve Move Play podcast. If you want to support what we're doing, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and hit that notifications button so you know what's coming up. And of course, the biggest support you can give is to become a Patreon supporter. This is what's going to allow us to grow this platform more than anything else. So this is entirely listener supported, and we really appreciate your support. And we look forward to talking to you again soon.